Do you know the little sort of folk gospel chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus? Nod your head if you do. I do. Can we just sing the first verse? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That's what Jesus faced in this story of his baptism. Up until now, his life and ministry had been hidden. We actually know almost nothing about what happened between the time that he appeared in the temple, this was the lesson just last Sunday, where he is 12 years old, he's in front of all the scribes and the Pharisees, and they are astonished because he talks to them not as a 12 year old, but actually as a peer. And they, have, uh, they are undone by his level of wisdom. And he says to his parents, who are frantic, they have no idea where he is. He said, didn't you know that I'm going to be and should be in my father's house? They didn't really know all that he meant. But that's the last time we see Jesus until now. Now puts him probably at around 30 years of age, as best we know. So this is, in some ways, the moment when Jesus' public life begins. When going from relative obscurity to literally taking his place on center stage. All the spotlights are on him. And that's actually the point of the lesson. That Jesus knows that at this point he is going to step into the water... I don't know whether he knows everything that's going to happen to him in that moment, but that is his inauguration. It is his stepping out. It is all of the, if you were to have it in, 20th, in the 21st century, there'd be news cameras there. People with camcorders and little cell phones taking pictures to remember the event. At that point, there would be for Jesus no turning back. Because you see, to turn is the essence of what it means to be Christian. You see, I'm going to get down here. Right there. When I, the assumption is, is that I'm walking this way, and what this way looks like is I'm in charge of my own life. I make the decisions. I determine what my future is going to be. I have the right to treat people as I want to treat them. I have the right to spend my money as I want to spend it. I have the right to make the decisions that are appropriate for me, and therefore that's my responsibility to do them, because surely no one is going to do it for me. But when Jesus comes, Jesus says, follow me. And to follow him is to turn. And the phrase out of the lesson, this gospel song, no turning back, means there's no turning from choosing to follow Jesus to turning back to being in control of my own life. That actually would be a betrayal, a deep betrayal. To make the decision to follow Jesus is the essence of what baptism means. And for Jesus, the essence of coming, in essence, out into public and to be baptized is his public decision to enter into what God had asked of him as God's Son and the Savior and the Redeemer of the world. So he steps out, as it were, onto the stage, and things begin to happen. He steps into the water. You know from some of the other stories, John, his first cousin, by the way, is like, oh, I, you should be baptizing me, because he knows who he is. But Jesus says, no, let it be done. Why? And he uses an interesting phrase, to fulfill all righteousness. Meaning, he's not doing it on his own behalf, for his righteousness. You see, because he's perfect. He, he doesn't need this moment of choosing to follow for his own sake. He's already made that decision. 
Remember the echo of the conversation in the temple when he's 12. Shouldn't I be in my father's house? See, he's already made that decision. He's on the path. He knows who he is. But instead, he does it as a demonstrated act for us. Both to show us what is being asked of us if we are to follow Christ. And as an act of his willing to do absolutely anything to bring us into his kingdom and into his love. Because baptism by its very nature means I'm a sinner in need of God. I'm a sinner in need of God. I am incomplete. I am broken. I need God to come and break in and bring forgiveness and mercy, mercy that I do not deserve but desperately need. The only way you can come to God is in that position of hunger. Not in the position of, yeah, I'm doing just fine and maybe God will help me out when I need it. Oh, no. That's also arrogance, pride. Inappropriate for a Christian. But for a Christian, it's always humility. It's always, I'm in need of God's mercy. It, it's always, there's part of me that is yet to be complete and I need God to come and set me right. And see, that's Jesus demonstrates that not because he needs it for himself, but he demonstrates that for us to see this is the way if we are to follow him, we are to follow him into that active commitment that baptism symbolizes, into that place where we're willing to say, God, I am yours, I am not going to go off my way, by your mercy, lead me in your way. Lead me in your way. Not, notice, I didn't say, I'll go your way. See, I need God to help me to do that. My resolution will often fail. It's the story of Peter. Lord, even if everybody else forsakes you, I won't forsake you. And that's the one that denied him three times before the Roman guards. That's, you see, us. I, need, we, I pray as I turn to follow him, I say, God, lead, lead me in your way. Take me by the hands and lead me in the way that I should go because I need all the help I can get to get there. You see, to come into this symbolic act of commitment that baptism expresses is to say, I need you more than anything else in the world. And so when Jesus steps into the waters of baptism, he submits to all that God has for him as Messiah, but he also leads the way for us to that same place of humility, of servanthood, of willing, the willingness to be led. And what happens to Jesus? The heavens open. A voice, an audible voice is spoken. People don't all recognize it in one of the other passages Somebody said, did it thunder? They heard something. But the words were clear enough for them to be recorded in the gospel. You are my son, my beloved. In you I am well pleased. So also the Son of God says to us, when we are willing to turn in that place of humility and to be led even in the places that we would necessarily choose for ourselves, but willing to say, God, I will follow you. Lead me in your way. God also pours out such incredible mercy and love. He also looks to us and says, you are my beloved. You are the ones that I love. There's a passion you see about it. It's expressed in the very familiar verse in the Gospel of John. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But love is not antiseptic. It is not at arm's length. Love has zeal to it. Love has passion to it. You are the ones that I love. You. Us. Because isn't it true that even though we say to him, lead me in the way that we should go, there's a part of me that goes, but I also want to do what I want to do. But Jesus, don't let me go. Isn't that right in your head? Yes. I mean, we all live with that kind of inner tension inside. And yet the good news is, is that his will is stronger than ours. 
That's why Paul writes that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So even though I would want to let go of one hand and try to do what I want to do, what does he do? He pulls me back. He said, no, you belong to me. Although sometimes what it takes for that to happen is that I reach over there because I grab the thing that I want that's dead wrong for me. It burns me like a hot stove. Oh, what have I done? And that's when Jesus goes, see, this is the place of safety. This is the place where I am yours and you are mine. Because he loves us. You are my beloved. And those are the things that are recorded about the baptism of Jesus. The interesting thing is, is that if you read the life of Jesus, what you see is some things that are remarkable, astonishing levels of miracles, incredible wisdom, powerful confrontations with evil. All of those are signs of the presence of God. But there is also suffering. There's also hardship. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Those also are signs of God at work in him because he is facing the very worst that life has to offer. So that you and I, when we get into those depths of places, because surely we do from time to time, we still know that we can look at God and say, you know what this is. You know what pain is like. You know what rejection is like. You know what horror and grief and disappointment are like. You experience them too. And because he did, that means I know that I can trust him. Even if it feels like life is literally falling out from under my feet. So to say yes to Jesus is to say yes to Him, knowing, knowing, because of who we are. There'll be times when I want to go this way. There'll be times of deep disappointment. There will also be times of wonder in terms of the grace of His presence and the tenderness of His forgiveness and the words spoken into our heart, You are my beloved. I will never leave you or forsake you. All of that is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. <laughs> you can't just have the nice parts. It's all of it. Because that's what life is, we humans, on this side of heaven. On the other side, it's different. That's where there's no pain or grief. On this side, there's pain and grief. But he leads us through it and provides for us what we need to be able to endure. So, these are making a renewed commitment that baptism expresses to say, yes, I will be a follower of Jesus, whether life goes well, or, and notice what I will do with some of them, if they're being confirmed, they give a little slap on the cheek. It's part of the confirmation service. But it's a commitment that they are making that's expressed in saying, I will follow Jesus even if life is difficult. I will not abandon him. Which is why at the very end I said, this is a courageous thing that you are doing. You are to be commended. But we also, we, will be reaffirming these very same commitments. So that if we've been like this, this is the time to say, to turn. I'm ready for both hands now. If it's like this and you feel secure to say, to reaffirm that commitment, thank God I belong to you, and that you will never let me go. Or if you're one of those people who show up at church, but really are here, you're not there. You're in charge. You may be particularly religious, but that doesn't mean you've yielded your life to Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that you have called him Lord, even though you may have used that word in your prayers, because only you know, no one else does, whether or not, regardless of what you might express outwardly, who's really in charge, who calls the shots, you 
Are you asking Him to do that? If you're over here, even if you're a very religious and a faithful member of this church or another, I would urge you to give up the charade and to say yes out of your heart so that as we go through these promises together, they become not just mere words you articulate into the air, but instead they become a conversation that you have with God and affirm that commitment to Him. Because He is the one, as we say every Sunday, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known. He knows. So please, if I can be this frank, don't lie to him. But find a way, even in the place of weakness, to say, yes, help me God. I'm willing to turn. So that all of us make this commitment together. In other words, we're not just watching them do it. We're in this together as a congregation and as a church to say in this new way, as we give thanks for Jesus' commitment in humility to enter into the waters for our behalf, to also say yes to him, God be my helper. I will follow you. Lead me in your way.